It's Sunday, January 21st, 2024, and we're going to look at the rest of the characters from just before 7 p.m. until the end of the day on June 15th, 2021. Let's get our age disclaimer out of the way. This podcast is rated for a mature audience only. If you are under 18 years old, this content is not for you. Thank you for visiting us. There's plenty of other content on YouTube for you to watch. Have a great day. All content not created by the blue-haired bingo babe, that's me, is presented under Title 17, Section 107, the Fair Use Doctrine, for news, education, and critique. If you're new here, welcome to the blue-haired bingo babe channel where we deal with social commentary, missing persons, and some true crime cases. Currently, we are looking at the Summer Wells story as we know it, two and a half years after she disappeared on June 15th, 2021. She was a five-year-old little girl. And according to TBI spokesperson Leslie Earhart, went missing sometime in the early afternoon of that same day from her home on 110 Ben Hill Road, Rogersville, Tennessee. At that time, her mother, her grandmother, and her three brothers were home on the property as far as we know. We have already dealt with the eight to three time frame and the three to just before seven time frame in yesterday's episode part two and we are now looking at the time frame where law enforcement has been called around 6 30 and shows up just after 7 p.m law enforcement changes our scene considerably and so we are putting all the characters in the context of how they would be written in literature. So this is looking at this little girl's case through the lens of storytelling. By six o'clock, for sure, it has become evident that Summer Wells is missing from her home on 110 Ben Hill Road. And just as a refresher, Candace Bly Summer's three brothers and Candace Herrer, Summer's grandmother, were all up on the hill, 110 Ben Hill Road. Do we know if anybody else was up there or not at that time? No, we don't. Across the street at 125 Ben Hill Road, Jody Sue Brown, sometimes known as JSB or JS, is home with her two children and her son, Damien Bernard, in this context, represents both children. To those eight people, we also add all the friends and neighbors who were doing whatever they do in the six to seven o'clock hour, making dinner, you know, entertaining friends, whatever they were doing. We don't know exactly how many people were in the hollow that is something law enforcement may very well know by now the tree trimmers we mentioned in yesterday's episode are also gone and we have to add one more character that has not yet been discussed and that is the red truck and more importantly its driver now, YouTube now requires me to identify every time I use an AI-generated image that might be misinterpreted for a real image. This is not the real truck. This is an AI-generated image of a red truck with black ladder rack, and I left out the white buckets, but there were white buckets seen in that truck. Sheriff Ronnie Lawson has told us that a, another delivery person familiar to law enforcement said they thought they saw a red truck with black ladder rack and white buckets on Bend Hill Road sometime that day. That's all we know. And nobody has ever come forward associated with that red truck. Back to the hill after 6.22 p.m. 
first person we need to take care of is where is Ch Chad Arnold, Fred Hill's friend? We don't know. Is he still down at Fred's during this whole series of events, or did he leave the hollow after Fred did? We just don't know. So according to both Candace, Bly, and Don Wells, two calls were made to law enforcement, one at 623, one at 626, at 630, maybe 631. Law enforcement in Hawkins County dispatches uh, responding officer and then goes on to inform Sheriff Ronnie Lawson and Tim Coop of Churchill Rescue Squad and they are dispatched. Churchill Rescue Squad and supporting law enforcement from surrounding counties were asked to go to the command center that was temporarily set up at Mount Carmel. Bacchus Church, um, a little bit northwest of 110 Ben Hill Road. And now it gets a little muddy again. So we have law enforcement up on the hill just after 7 p.m. talking to Candace. And then both Andy Bernard and Don Wells are muddy about exactly when they got there. Don Wells was about an hour away, maybe 45 minutes away, if you take back roads, in Johnson City. And he says he lead-footed it and beat the police there. And I'm sorry, that's just not likely. Because Don went to the bottom property first and then went up around up um, Ben Hill, Beach Creek Road, onto Ben Hill Road and met with police. By then, Andy was there. So, sorry, Don, somebody had to be first. And in my opinion, it was law enforcement, Andy Bernard, and then you. Let's reshuffle the card deck. We have law enforcement talking to Don and Candace. We have all the Bernards down at the foot of their driveway at 125. Ben Hill Road, and then Fred and Laura show up. So presumably they've already talked to law enforcement once at the junction of Beach Creek Road and Ben Hill Road and have been waved through because they live there. They probably stopped and said hi to Andy and what's going on, that kind of conversation, and then went down to take their travel trailer down to Fred's house. It is known that they did come back up to uh, 125 and stood with Andy and the Bernards for a while. How long? I don't remember. I don't even know if Fred remembers. What we do know is that Don went down to Fred's around 10 o'clock, according to both Don and Fred. So maybe... Fred and Laura came down for our 45 minutes or an hour and then went back home. I'm trying to strike a balance here between new people who may not be as familiar with the Summer Wells case and people who have been around for a year or two or, you know, going on three. So we're going to stop here and we're going to go back to our character types and our character archetypes list for a uh, minute or two and see if we can tease out any more roles and archetypes that people we have talked about in the last couple of days are fitting into. First on deck is Andy Bernard. If you're familiar with Andy's uh, recent interview with Cher as well as a year ago with Crime Stories Illuminated, I think, then you have a pretty good feel for the basics of Andy's personality. Next on deck is law enforcement and all that cohort. And we're going to skip them because we already know they are a standard archetype uh, character in a story. They're authoritarian to a greater or lesser degree. So let's bring in Don Wells. The only other character that we have introduced into this scenario 
from yesterday. And look, Don Wells may be your main number one suspect for two and a half years. But, well, two years, seven months, and a handful of days. But what I want you to consider is this new lens. Looking at all these people from the standpoint of how they appear in literature. And I should also note that the character roles are, are pretty fixed. Those are pretty standard character roles. But on the other side, the character archetypes, there's a whole lot more. And if you think there's a character archetype that you're very familiar with, um, that you'd like to suggest Don fits into, or any of the other ones for that matter, by all means, drop it in comments below. That's it for this episode where we looked at where the characters are fitting in the story, what level they're on, and what roles they could be playing. God bless you. I'll see you real soon.